Hello everyone, my name is Christian. Welcome back to Tech Point. Today, our guest is Mark, the CEO and co-founder at ScreenCloud. Hello. Hi, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's nice to meet you. Please tell us what is ScreenCloud. Yeah, so ScreenCloud is a, um, a SaaS platform for digital signage. So digital signage is basically screens that probably most people see, you know, out and about, maybe at like restaurants like McDonald's showing menu boards or outside in the world doing advertising or in retail. Uh, we actually focus more on screens that are employee facing, so communication screens and helping large customers, well, small and large customers um, manage that network of screens and push content up to it. Okay. Uh, what is the biggest problem that you solve for companies? Um, well, I think there's several problems that we solve. I mean, firstly, actually controlling a network of screens, um, usually in many, many locations. Um, and those in, those IT environments are often quite different and quite challenging. Sometimes Wi-Fi is not very good. Sometimes they have different kind of network configurations, etc. So sort of working with a centralized IT team to control hundreds of screens in multiple locations, even countries, um, and get them all connected and working in the same way is, is kind of hard. And then I guess beyond that, it's actually helping them get the content that they want to see up onto that screen and fresh, you know, um, sometimes even live, uh, so that content doesn't go stale and out of date. I understand. I understand. What are our best features? Oh, um, well, so the, the best features, I mean, there's many, I have lots of, uh, lots of them <laughs> that I like, um, I'll, I'll pick out a few of them. So, so actually at the lowest level, um, one of the things we, we never in, in, intended to do this, but a few years ago, we decided to build our own operating system for screens. So um, one of the issues that is that when, um, when people usually deploy screens, they'll use an operating system like Windows or Android, but these were never really developed with a screen first attitude, right? They were a kind of, yeah. they, they, they have many more features than you require. And actually a lot of the features that are say useful um, for like a desktop or mobile experience are actually not useful for screen. Um, so we basically developed our own operating system. It's basically Linux, but we stripped it back uh, and just included um, elements that we needed. Um, so it's much more performant um, and actually more secure because it can do less. And it's very much every setting is configured for a screen first. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible to set up and deploy a screen um, and also to do it cost effectively. So that's kind of like one of my favorite features that just helps people get working really reliably easily. Um, beyond that, we have a couple of cool ones. Um, we have a secure dashboards feature, which means that we can show dashboards from behind a login. So we kind of mm -hmm. cloud encrypt some read only credentials and effectively act like a user and screenshot um, dashboards and then push them when they change up to screen. Uh, so that's really good for uh, business intelligence and getting those dashboards out there, but doing it securely. Um, and actually another cool feature we have is a, a new one, which we've just pushed out, which is called our feeds platform. And that's a universal way of taking access to multiple different systems. So it could be like an HR system like Workday, could be an intranet like SharePoint, pulling content out of that and then normalizing it and then formatting it intelligently for screen because most people don't know how to format for screen and things like that. And to basically automate a huge amount of content. So we've got, I mean, and we've got many, many more <laughs> that I could tell you about, but those yeah, are my favorites. Thank you for, thank you for sharing. Um, what are the use cases? So who, who can use the product and why should they do it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, when we first began, we were kind of targeting more like SMB customers or, you know, basically people with fairly simple needs. And those use cases were far and wide. I mean, we have thousands of customers and they're using it for all sorts of various reasons from like churches to, you know, hotels, hospitals. I mean, you, you, can, you can pretty much name anything. We've probably got a customer doing it, but that's generally more at the smaller level where maybe there's like five screens or less or even 10 screens, but not, not too much. But when we got into like the enterprise side, which we kind of evolved up into as we matured as a business, we realized that actually for enterprise customers, you've got to, um, you've got to really go deep on the use case. So the use case that we focused on is this, in, in, we just call it screens that communicate, but basically that's an umbrella term for screens that are facing either employees or in education, it could be students and things like that. And then you're really thinking, okay, this use case is about informing people, not about trying to sell them burgers or promotions or whatever. Like that. This is about trying to inform inform them of what's going on. So kind of news and updates about you know uh, the company, people, but also practical stuff like health and safety, 
and that, you know, um, business intelligence, so showing data and visualizing data as well. So, so kind of think about all of those times where people are looking at that screen, trying to understand what's going on in the environment and in the business or in the organization of which I'm a part of. That's kind of like our umbrella use case. And hence why we do like a lot of integrations with Microsoft products, right? It's kind of, obviously they're going to be using, you know, enterprises will be using a lot of those. So, so we, we kind of put our product roadmap more towards that use case. How important is the App Store for you? Because I have, I saw you have a lot of apps. Uh, oh, do you mean our, the... our, our own App Store? Yeah, yeah the marketplace. Yeah, <laughs> the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, actually, that, that's kind of fundamental, really, because um, most people will want to upload content in a file format, and we're actually trying to break away from this. So, so most people think of a screen; they're going to put oh, put some images, videos, and you know, whatever up there. The problem is that they're not going to be able to make enough content regularly enough um, for that not to go completely out of date. And, and bear in mind, the, the environment we're in, people are working there every day or pretty much every day. So they're going to see this content a lot. It's not like going into a shop, which you might go in like once a year. So you could see your videos on a loop. That's fine because it's, it's going to just only hit you once. But in this use case, if you're seeing the same stuff just showing over and over, you're going to get sick of it. And what you're going to learn to do is ignore it because you're going to go, this, is, this isn't really relevant. So... We're trying to encourage customers to bring um, the web to screens. So that's kind of our mission. Our background is as web developers. So we want to make an amazing web experience on screens. And the best way we think that that, that works uh, for everyone is by hooking it up to the systems you're already using. So it might be the HR system or the intranet or whatever, and pull content from there and then push that up to screen automatically rather than waiting for some person to do it. So those integrations are really what formed our app store, and we have about 70 of them. And actually, to some degree, I'm going to say it's like fundamental to what we do, but also I'm going to say, actually, it's not going to be that fundamental in the future because we're going to really start to replace this with the feeds platform mm. where it's much more versatile, which we can break out to almost taking anything because they're just, there's a very long tail of apps and products that people use in various environments. You're never going to build an integration with all of them. You've got to do it more like a, a universal connector. So that's, that's, but in the early days, it really powered a lot of what we do. And I'd say every successful customer with us is using at least three or four apps in there and they're covering all those major use cases. Can you share your favorite success story of a happy customer? Yeah, well, actually, um, so I just got back um, to the UK from a trip to North Carolina. So I actually kind of went and, and spent some time with, with customers out there. So I saw um, EJ Gallo, who's a major uh, wine producer in the US, mm -hmm. um, a freight company called Old Dominion Freight Line, who, again, big trucking company across the US, and Coca-Cola, um, actually their bottling company, Coca-Cola Consolidated. And they basically, they, they put, Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola products in all the bottles. Yeah. So um, these were the three customers I was working with last week, and um, yeah, they're all they're all very happy. We're, we're um, we've kind of they're established with them. We've rolled out probably over about a year. The, the first year of our relationship is usually very much an IT relationship where we're getting screens online. We're we're working with um, usually quite strict security um, requirements because we're basically a part of their network. So we have to build this trust with IT. So year one can be a little bit sort of boring in what we're trying to achieve. We, we, the main thing is rolling out is complicated and it's lots of locations and not always having IT on the ground. So so um, so we've got through that phase with all of them. And now we're getting into the more kind of interesting stuff where we're um, basically layering up the content and trying to do more integrations internally and start to make the screen content more dynamic because often it will start quite simple um, because, mm -hmm. you know, they might not really have a very strong idea of what they could achieve with a screen. And then by working with us over time, we kind of slowly, we don't want to like rush them too much towards something. So we slowly kind of educate them and bring them on board and, you know, connect up a dashboard, connect up a system. Um, with Old Dominion, we did a little bit of work. They didn't have any graphic design skills internally. So we made a whole series of templates and kind of made some color coordination based on the type of information that was shown. And, that was quite nice to see that out in the wild and actually walking around a massive truck depot, seeing the screens up there, getting feedback actually also from people who are, are working there on the front line. Um, so yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. And what is the pricing for a screen cloud? Yeah, so we actually have a very simple pricing, um, which is basically it's a per screen per month model, which is kind of how most of the industry does it. I think that in future, I'd actually like to move towards more of a value-based pricing because... Um, 
not all screens are born equal. You know, you might have just a screen in the lobby just kind of showing a bit of promotional material. It's not really that important. But then a screen out, you know, in the depot, which has got a dashboard on it, which is critical for making decisions about what's happening. Like those screens have a different degree of value. <laughs> yeah, one is like, yeah. okay, that's nice. The other one is, okay, that's really important. <laughs> um, but at the moment, the industry is very much sees a screen as a screen. So it's kind of per screen per month. We do mostly annual contracts. Um, and we do have a couple of pricing tiers. So we have our core pricing tier, which basically gives you kind of everything out of the box that you'd want to do with a screen. And our pro pricing, you know, has more advanced features such as um, live streaming, broadcasting video, those secure dashboards, more enterprise features around. Um, it's quite important to, for the compliance to know about proof of play and logging. So if you're showing health and safety information, you need to have proof like granular proof that that piece of content was actually shown on a screen um, just in case there is an investigation and people could say, well, actually, look, the content has been shown and we can prove it. So so you get more into the enterprise use case on the pro pricing. Okay. How competitive is your space? You mentioned it. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it, it, it's very competitive in, in a sense that there are many, many players in the space, um, but a lot of them are very much kind of like quite small. You know, not not You're not really. Biggest, right? I think we're the biggest of the new generation. There are there are incumbents that have been around for like thirty years who who are bigger than us, um, oh. uh, but they're more like kind of what I would describe as Generation One. And you know, and respect that le these guys are doing a lot of powering a lot of screens, but their their DNA comes from the audio visual world, right? Because it had mm -hmm. to. Because thirty years ago. This was very much a hardware driven product. If you didn't get your hardware right, um, it wasn't going to really work for you. So, so you've got to be a real hardware expert to kind of run them. And then software kind of got tagged on the top. And to be honest, the software is pretty bad. Like it's, it's, it's clearly not a software first company because it, it would never have been. So of generation two or three, however you like, I want to look at it. You know, we're, we're cloud first, we're web first, we're software first. We are agnostic on hardware. Like we do sell our own, but we don't have to use that. You could use whatever else you want. We don't mind. And we don't make money. Also, we don't price in hardware. We pri we, our success is soft, software licenses and greater use of our software. So we're very much taking that you know, web first approach. And I think of the generation of those companies, of which there are others, um, we are, I don't say we're the biggest, but we are, you know, they're not that far behind. Like there's probably maybe some around 50% of our size and, and revenue. Um, but so I don't take it for granted that we are. Uh, and I, I think we've also seen some consolidation in the space recently where private equity has come in and rolled up quite a lot of competitors. It's actually been good news for us because it's made it less people. And to be honest, I don't really believe in the roll up principle myself um, because I'm a product person. I don't think you can take five products and just whack them together and think everything's going to be fine. Like, yeah, I've migrated one from one version of our software to another and it took two years. So how does five competing products uh, work brilliantly? Nonetheless, that's what they've been doing. Um, and, but that's actually made it a bit easier for us because this, that's created some chaos. And in that chaos, there's room for us to grow and, and, and take more market share. Thank you for explaining. And when did you start the company? So the company began uh, actually literally eight, ooh, but two weeks ago, eight years ago. So in April 2015. Um, now, I was actually born out of another company. So me and my uh, co-founders actually had worked together uh, running a services business before that. Um, mm -hmm. So we were, running, we were basically doing web and mobile products, builds, design for clients. We had built some of our own side projects. We, we had done some of our own stuff before, but nothing as big as this. Um, but we wanted to transition away from being, you know, project oriented because it's, it's really good work. I really enjoyed it, but it's, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's never ending because you always have to kind of win and win your next work, win your next work. Yeah. It's really hard to scale. scale. So um, me and Luke, particularly, who's the CTO, really wanted to move towards SaaS. We had had some experience of it before uh, and go kind of all in on one product. Um, so that's what we did in 2015. Uh, so we kind of prototyped it a bit before that, um, but we formed the company then, raised some angel money, and we commercially launched at the end of 2015, started going from 2016. Okay, okay. How big is your uh, entire team right now? So at the moment, I believe we're just over 110 people. Uh, we're in four locations in the world, so London, uh, Belfast, Los Angeles, and Bangkok in Thailand. 
Um, and uh, we're about, we're pretty product led in terms of um, our people. So we're about 50% is product and engineering. Um, and then 50% is kind of go to market and operations and stuff. You will see increasingly that actually we'll see the sales and go to market and customer success side probably expand quite a lot more. You don't need to like add millions more engineers, but the, the product team will always be a, a big, big part of what we do because I am a big believer in product led growth and yeah, you've got to, you've got to balance both of these things out, but initially you, you really got to show you that you're differentiated and, and get the product right before you start adding an army of salespeople to be promoting it. Absolutely. Absolutely. What has been your best growth tactic for getting new people to the platform? All right. Okay. Good question. Um, I would say that our best growth tactic was to invest heavily in content and really believe in the power of content. Um, I think when, I think everyone probably gets that, but I'm not sure how many people get just how long you need to be committed to it and how committed you need to be. Um, I think everyone will spit out some content, but <laughs> honestly, you've got to have a proper, like a proper strategy for it. And in the early days, I mean, the best strategy we had, um, I, I can't take credit for this, but uh, I, I was part of it was, um, so we had an excellent um, freelancer who was doing content for us two days a week. It's all we could basically afford at the time. Actually, she ended up joining us full time in the end, but um, she, um, what she would do is every couple of weeks, bear in mind at this point, I was everything that wasn't engineering. So I'm sales, success, support, finance, admin. I mean, you know, it's kind of normal. Like all of our small team was really the engineering team and then me yeah. uh, pretty much. I, I, like, and then one other person helping me part time. Um, but what that meant was I heard like literally everything every customer had to say. <laughs> so what would happen is every two weeks, she would get on the phone with me and interview me, record the call. And then I think it was still early days could transcribe the call. And all she would do is it's like, what have customers been talking about? Like what questions have they been asking in the last few weeks? I obviously would easily be able to explain all of that. And then she would then take that and turn that into blog posts of what would people actually be Googling and asking. So uh, to this day, still, we get a lot of inbound trialists um, into the platform from content that we maybe have refreshed, but basically wrote years ago and have really, really high rankings on. So, you know, as an early stage tactic, it's, it doesn't last forever and you can't exactly dial it up. Like you can't, can't ask the world to Google more. They're only going to Google as much as they're going to Google. Oh. But, um, but there's plenty of people out there who are Googling. So initially, you know, just be found and also be helpful. And it has a byproduct of not only discoverability, you can't just churn out shit. Like it, it, it's not, it has to be good. It has to be actually useful and informative. And then, you know, that leads straight into your product. Thank you so much for sharing. It's, uh, it's wonderful. What has been your biggest challenge since starting the company? Oh, um, I mean, like, I've, I, there are a lot of them, but I, I would have to say, well, which one to pick the tech crash or COVID? <laughs> um, I think I'll probably go with COVID. I mean, COVID was not good for us. I mean, a lot of SaaS companies really did very, very well during COVID and, and, you know, fair enough, full power to them, you know, like genuinely mean that, but for us, it obviously wasn't good because screens go in places, which pretty much got shut. So, um, <laughs> You know, it was very challenging for us um, uh, to get through that. And I think, you know, the initial the initial shock of COVID and basically a universal shutdown. I mean, not all the not all the lockdowns that happened happened at the same time, at the same place. So that actually was good for us. So, you know, California might be shut, but, you know, Florida was open. So there was still work that we could do. But initially, almost everything was shut. Uh, and that, that was really tough. Um, we had no idea to what degree we were going to suffer for it. And obviously a lot of customers, you know, were, were struggling themselves and a lot went out of business, especially those smaller customers that we initially had. So, you know, revenue was definitely going to drop um, and we didn't know <laughs> to, to, to what degree it would happen. So, you know, we had to take some defensive tactics um, in terms of protecting the team, looking after existing customers. Uh, we were very proactive in how we, we, we went forward and offered credit. We just said, look, we, what we don't want to do is have people churn um just unnecessarily but what we also don't really want to do is have people paying us for something they're just not getting any value of so we we proactively said look there's credit and you know what a lot of customers said you know thank you for the offer but we won't take it we we want to support you because we want you guys to survive 
Um, and we also know we need, we need the solution. We need the solution coming out. So we're not going to churn. We want to keep it going on. And actually, those that did take the credit, the nice thing about that was the financial hit was then spread out over pretty much the next 12 months because the credit then comes due, you know, when they renew. So if it was monthly, yes, that's going to start straight away. But if they're on an annual, that, that credit will apply, you know, whenever that annual contract comes into play and they get a cheaper, you know, cheaper, cheaper renewal rate. But what that meant was financially, we weren't getting like punched in the face on day one as bad as we could. So yeah, that was really hard. You know, it's really scary. And obviously there was just the fact that like, from a personal point of view, like, you know, people were dying, you know, and we were locked in our homes and we don't know what's going on, but you've also got this huge business challenge going on at the same time. Um, I needed to do some defensive fundraising. That was extremely tough because no one really wants to back you when you're when you're going down <laughs> it's for, for fairly obvious reasons. But, you know, three months before I'd had all these investors like desperately trying to give me money because we were growing really nicely. Um, and then suddenly they didn't, didn't take my call anymore, which is like, uh, you know, that's what happened. So, yeah, that was tough. But I, I'm, I'm proud of how we navigated through um, and we, we, we looked after the team. And I think we'd, we stood right by our customers um, and we did the right things. But you know, it was easy to say that in retrospect. At the time, those are really hard decisions to make. And you have to do them extremely quickly in conditions that you've never experienced before. So, yeah, super challenging. Oh, and I actually also got COVID right at the beginning. So I was sick as well. <laughs> Just to add, <laughs> that, add one extra. more little thing on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little extra is like I'm coughing all the way through my meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Understand. But uh, you, did that, you did not raise uh, during the COVID, right? During the pandemic. Um, so actually, well, it's a bit complicated, but we sort of did. I don't know how many of your uh, listeners are from the UK, um, but there was quite an interesting UK government scheme called the Future Fund, um, mm -hmm. which was actually one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of much of the UK government, if I'm honest, but um, <laughs> but this 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 was useful. So what they did, what they recognized was there were, there were UK startups, which were good companies that had had good growth and, you know, deserved to live, which might actually die because of this COVID situation, because of because of a funding gap. Um, you have to remember that in this first few months of COVID, like funding just stopped completely. Like, because like, no one knew what was going on. Now, then there was that crazy time where everyone was getting funded. But at, at this early stage, everything just went on pause whilst people figured out what to do. And most investors, in fairness, were probably just looking after their own portfolio and trying to figure out what this means. Um, that was not great for us. So the Future Fund basically said, if you can, whatever investment you can raise, uh, I think it was up to a cap, I'm not sure what that was, but anything you can raise from, from a accredited investor, basically a recognized investor like a VC, we will match, the UK government will match it. And that will basically become a convertible note, which they'll then convert later down the line if you do another round of financing or whatever that might, might, be, like, might be. So it, we couldn't raise much, but what we could do is go to our existing investors and raise a certain amount i think it was just over, over about a million and a half something like that um and then that was matched by the future fund and i think because it was being matched you know everyone sort of just rallied a bit and and, and to be honest we had some some of those some of the, that money a fair chunk of that money actually came from angels but which really really that we we, we we had a very good relationship with our angels and and they really believed in us so they i was very surprised and quite humbled by by then putting in the money at that point, um, at a point where it did not look phenomenally good for us and no one knew what was happening. But that, that was quite useful. So I did fundraise, but it was quite defensive and you know done using that scheme and my own investors. But yeah, I did manage to get something uh, done. And we also actually did some venture debt as well. So, um, mm. which I'm actually quite, I think once you're a bit of maturity, venture debt is actually quite a good thing to do. You should never use it for product market fit, but you can use it for scaling a business which exactly. is quite reliable and, and we've had a very good relationship with our venture debt supplier and they keep asking us to take more <laughs> <laughs> but without the funding uh, the funding do you think uh, you would survive the pandemic no. No. no no i don't think we would have um uh well okay i mean we, we obviously we, i think we were we were about eight million arr so obviously we were, we were making money i think what we would have had to do is without that funding we would have to we would have to cut a lot of the team um, which would have also been really sad, but like that would have been the only way we could do it. So I think we probably could have survived, but it would have been, I mean, it would be like kind of going back and rebuilding everything completely. Um, so we were very we were very cautious during the period. Like we didn't, the money that we did get, we you know we were we didn't go kind of crazy in terms of how we were hiring and, and spending, but um, it did give us the ability to to 
to use that period to, uh, I guess, realign ourselves to ready to come out of the other side of the pandemic and yeah. really be enterprise ready, which is kind of what we've been working on the last few years. So there was an opportunity just to kind of like focus on product, focus on the customers you still got, and just kind of start to build up the muscle that you need for enterprise, which isn't just product. You need, you need quite a lot of other elements as well. What is your vision for, uh, for Screen Cloud for the coming years? Ah, well, um, well, actually, the vision, I think, really is, is to be, I mean, ideally, to, um, you know, controlling as many screens as we can globally. And I, I think, I mean, it, no, you could easily say that. I want every screen powered by screen cloud. <laughs> actually, if I'm honest, I don't think I want every screen to be powered by screen cloud, but I want, I want every screen that faces an employee. Um, I, well, I'd love that when they were thinking about who they were going to use, that we were in the conversation for every single time. We're, I'm pretty obsessed, um, you know, and, and as a result, the whole, the whole company is pretty obsessed um, with screens that communicate. I, I think that screens aren't used anywhere near enough inside of businesses, but we stick screens on a wall anyway, um, but we don't really know why. And I think there's a problem with like the last mile delivery of like how we get really relevant content up on a screen. But screens can be enormously powerful in those environments, uh, especially we are the deskless or frontline workers who aren't on a laptop or on a phone or have even have an email address. Like we can be the digital surface that they see what's happening. Now, every environment is connected, right? We've all got systems and software which is running that environment, but how do we actually see it unless we're on our phone or laptop, which most people aren't? You know, 80% of the world is actually a deskless worker. We're, we're the minority on our laptops all day. So, so I'm pretty obsessed with this idea and I would love that in those kind of environments that screen cloud is like the major vendor of choice. Um, and that we're really helping, you know, power communication that's actually valuable and being a, you know, a force for good in those environments. I'd love to hear your backstory. So how you started your career from the beginning? Right. Yeah. So, um, well, I'll go all the way back to the nineties when I was a teenager. Sure. Um, so, uh, basically at school, um, I first saw the web. I think I was about 16, 17 years old when I first saw my first web page. It was like a, hor a horrible Yahoo directory, but I, I was completely fit, uh, you know, hooked. I was like, this is amazing. This is the future. But my school at the time, you know, as, as many were, we, we were quite traditional. You know, they, they wanted everyone to go and be an accountant or a lawyer <laughs> or something else, a teacher. Um, and, and, and IT was, was not really kind of pushed that hard. So I had to kind of learn most of the skills, especially web skills, um, kind of on my own. Right. So like, like most people, those early days, you're all self-taught. Yeah. Um, and then um, I went to, so I, I went to university and did history. Uh, so I, I kind of, you know, I went through the path that my school would naturally push me on. But I, but in my spare time, I kept learning um, more about web development and web design. I mean, all pretty horrible stuff. Even some of my first websites are pretty, pretty <laughs> bad. Um, but, you know, they worked. Um, and, and to be honest, back then, anyone who knew how to do that was, was kind of quite in demand. Um, it was a pretty rare skill. Yeah. I then went into um, corporate IT. Um, that seemed like the best route. Um, I was a bit nervous about kind of going alone <laughs> and things like that. My mom and dad ran their own business for years, and I've seen the, the up and downs of, of, of what it's like to run your own thing. So I kind of went, went for the safety of corporate. I got a corporate IT job for PwC, who ultimately became part of IBM, so being an IT consultant. So I did kind of like enterprise systems integration um for a while but when they sold to ibm i uh, i actually um got made redundant at that point <laughs> so i had a choice and I, I chose to go down the web development route I, I was just i was just completely convinced then that this is the route to go so i went to a web development agency and that's where i met luke and david who became my co-founders and then we went on started our own agency did that for many years 2010, we started building products. And so you kind of see it evolving into this. So we, we've built hundreds and hundreds of web products over the time. Um, and it's, it's been a, a slow evolution. And then really Screen Cloud, it, it, it's not a story to look at in isolation. You've got to bear in mind the 13 years before or more, going back to those teenage years. Yeah. Or, or that's how you build your skill base up and you get really knowledgeable about something. And even then, we still got a lot to learn. But that's, that's the origin story. Absolutely. What's your best piece of advice for a starting founder? Uh, yeah, um, your mind just floods with things. Actually, if there's one thing, like at the beginning, it's, I've got to be honest, it's pretty dark at the beginning, right? When you're trying to get something out there, you don't have much money, 
Like the the reality is most of these things fail, right? We know that. I think it's 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 a it's a huge statistic. There's so few that even get to one million ARR, and very even fewer that get to ten and, and growth. So you know that you're against the odds, right? Um, and that weighs on your mind because the problem is that you you're plowing away at this thing and you you don't know what the outcome is going to be. It always looks simple in the rearview mirror, but like everything's simple in the rearview. <laughs> Exactly. Look forward. Look forward to the future, and yeah, suddenly people are a little bit less sure about things, you know. Um, so, so my main advice is that um, you have to come to, to peace with the idea that there isn't just a single like way of doing this, right? There is every business is different, and every situation and time that you you know starting in, it's never going to be the same. So you can't just like replicate what worked for other people. It doesn't really work like that. Um, what you've got to do is basically get up out of bed every single day and carry on. And at the end of the day, go to sleep, get up and do it again. And it's, it, for me, it's that kind of relentless, like effort of just doing what you need to do, but, but not giving up that, that, that is the kind of key thing. Cause in 2016, that was like my hard year of like trying to grow this thing. And in the back of my mind, is this pointless? Is this, you know, is this going to actually be a good idea or not? And it's just that, just get up, just speak to your customers, do your sales, do your marketing, release your product, you know, feedback loop, go again, you know, keep iterating and improving. It's, it's a really boring answer, but the reality is success comes from grinding it out for a long time, not from like having some sort of clever tactic, really. I mean, obviously you've got to have some tactics and some strategy to what you're doing. But I think the best strategy is just to talk to your customers, listen, get their feedback, implement, and, and roll over and go again. What's your favorite SaaS product apart from uh, Screen Cloud? Oh, my favorite SaaS product. Uh, I mean, probably the one we actually use the most is Slack. I mean, Slack is kind of our internal comms tool. Obviously, we've always we've been distributed. I mean, even on day one, we were we were Thailand and and UK. Um, and I think, you know, um, it, it, you know it's, it's probably the first thing I open on my phone. <laughs> so like uh, I mean, a lot of people will kind of hate it. They're like, oh, they say, oh, there's way too many channels. It's too noisy. But I mean, I think, you know, if you can master Slack and how to use it, I think it's an insanely powerful tool. Um, and I'm a real big believer in asynchronous communication, not everything always being live and direct. So um, and I, I think you can also you can hack on Slack quite a lot. You can do a lot more than probably most people sort of realize and and integrate things quite quite neatly. So, um, yeah, that's the first one that comes to mind, which um, which you know I use every single day, every single hour, pretty much <laughs> at my wake. Um, and um, and yeah, I'm a big believer. And I know Teams has completely overtaken them, but Slack is the OG, and and the uh, the product is really good. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Is there anything else that you want to tell us today on the podcast? Um, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, obviously, assuming this is mostly listened to by, by, by founders of SaaS companies, is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, well, I guess I kind of reiterate that like, this is really, really hard, but there is plenty of room, um, out there for, for various products. Um, most markets are way, way bigger than you think. <laughs> um, and actually if I was giving one tip, uh, extra, which I think is a good tactical tip, if possible, um, go to America first. That's what we did. Um, and it, it worked out hugely well. I think if you're going to be a big SaaS product, the reality is you still, you need to conquer America at some point. So if you're like a Western European startup, like we were, um, and for regulatory reasons, you know, like say if it's like a finance product or a property product, then yes, every market is different how those work, but screens are screens. So I'm a actual, I think there's a common sort of, common trope that you should go for your home country first. I, I, I completely disagree. I'm like, if you can go at America first, find out from them because it's much harder to go into new territories when you're sort of building up. But you know, it's quite easy to kind of fake it. Like we you just use American English, you get an American cell phone number, which forwards to your thing. Uh, you get an American bank account address. It's, it's not hard. Um, and then you just be a little vague with how, you know, oh, I'm kind of between the UK and America. like. And the customers don't mind that much. It's not like you're completely Absolutely. lying, but you, you, I think you should market to that market first if you can, um, because if you get that working, we're eighty-five percent revenues USA, right? Um, for, and we, we didn't have anyone really. We didn't have an office in the USA until twenty eighteen, 
So that would be my advice if it's a good bit of tactical. Otherwise, I'd just say keep grinding and um, yeah, run your own race and all those other slight cliches, but but keep grinding and just, just get up every day and do the work. Thank you so much for joining. You shared the immense value. <laughs> I'm super grateful. Uh, pleasure. Thank you for having me on.